Well, good evening, good evening. Give me a little power on this. Good evening, good evening. Flow like a river, Jesus. We thank God today. I'm getting all set up here. I'm in the right spot now, guys. All right. Come on, somebody put your hands together and give God a praise for all that he's done. It's time for another Wednesday night live. God has a word. If you have been following us, it has not been a word about uh, just Bible scriptures or just trying to follow. We're trying to teach you a principle tonight about walking in the kingdom of God. Grab somebody, call somebody, tell somebody. Tonight we're going to talk about how to be in a safe place. Tonight we're looking at a special uh uh, part of the kingdom of God, we're looking at something that's going to teach you why it's important that you walk and rise in the power of God. If you've been with us on this series, you know it has been excited, and we're getting ready to dive way right in. Open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to be there with you. But the kingdom on the teaching we're doing tonight is about the Sermon on the Mount which is part of coming into the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something so you understand why you need to know this teaching. First of all, God's main plan, his priority throughout all time, putting Adam and Eve in the garden, watch this, follow me, is because he wanted to extend heaven on earth. He wanted to make earth like heaven. He gave Adam and Eve heavenly authority. We were made in the image of God, Imago Dei. We were made in God's image. What does that mean? That means that God wanted us to walk in authority in his kingdom. But then, you know, the fall, they messed it up. But God's plan was to have a kingdom on earth. And watch this. We were to be those who operated. His sons and daughters, we operate that kingdom of power. So tonight, the only safe place you want to be in this uh, coronavirus area, era, season that we're in, there's a safe place, and that's in the kingdom of God. This is not teaching about something spooky or about telling you about supernatural stuff as much as it's a teaching about your rightful inheritance in God, in the kingdom of God. So let me pray. Let me pray real quick because I got to pray so we get into the word of God. Always pray. Always bring the Holy Spirit in. I know nothing without the Holy Spirit. And he pray. Father God, we thank you tonight for the awesomeness of your power. We thank you tonight, God, for how you blessed us. There's somebody out there that's going to blossom and bloom and grow even during this time of darkness because your word is light and your light of your word cannot be hidden. We thank you tonight, God, as we go into your word and we give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so grab your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Let me just get started so you can see we're not doing a lot of reviewing tonight. But what I need you to see is we're talking about the kingdom of God as a priority. We've been through that. You've seen that. And then we talk about that Christ came to establish his kingdom on earth. That's his greatest mission. We talked about that. So get that in your mind. God established the kingdom. Jesus won all of that back for us. So the subject of the kingdom of God was Jesus' message that was dominated through his parables, through his sermons, and through his miracles. So we've already talked about, so far, we've talked about the Mount Olivet in time. You should have been here for that teaching. It's so relevant. You know, people are asking because of the season we're in, is this the end time? Well, duh. Yeah, we're, we're at the box. Look, everything else fails, but the Bible is true. So we need to realize that God's word is always going to be fulfilled whether anything else is. So look at what we talked about, the parables. We still have to go talking about to the church, John 17, 18. But tonight we're dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. Forget what you think you know about the Sermon on the Mount. Open your Bible. It is the standard. It is above anything you and I could actually ever reach for. The Sermon on the Mount is where God actually teaches us 
how to walk in his rule and his reign on earth. The Sermon on the Mount is something that we will never fulfill. Some of us know that there's, there's been times in our life where we have never ever, where we have not been walking in what we know to walk in because it's too hard. God asked us to do some crazy things. Jesus wanted to show us heaven, show us his kingdom, so he gave us kingdom principles in Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Please pull out your Bible and listen as I read this stuff, and you'll understand what God was trying to say in the Sermon on the Mount. He wants us to know that that's his standard, and so he taught us everything by parables. Okay, this is what we're dealing with tonight. I'm there now. My fear. It's called striving on the mount. Jesus went up to the mount. I'm going to read. I'm going to read. Grab your Bible. Let's read this together. Grab your Bible. We're going to read this. My phone locked me out, but I broke the code. Here we go. Go to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start at the end of it. Please cherish these words. This stuff is it's above everything. I heard Andy Stanley say that this is the craziest doctrine you ever heard. And I was listening in how other teachers had taught this. But what I see in the Sermon on the Mount is I see the transparency of Jesus saying, my parables taught you ethics, but my Sermon on the Mount is going to teach you character. How do I live and walk in the kingdom? So we know the setting, let me get the setting, Jesus grabs his disciples, and at that time when we start reading about Jesus' disciples, it does not mean just the 12 disciples, he grabs everyone who was following him. Good news tonight, he grabs those who reach out for him. So we're going to talk about how do I strive to measure up to the upside down world of the kingdom on what Jesus spoke about in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's talk about it. I'm going to read NIV. Listen to the word. Now, when Jesus saw the crowd, he went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came near him, and he began to teach them. That's important. He sat down, and he began to reach out and teach them principles. He was saying, now I'm going to teach you about your behavior and your conduct. Maybe the blessings aren't in your life because we don't take this seriously. You know, we love parts of the word of God that we love, and we walk in those parts that we can walk in, and we point fingers at other people. We want to point fingers at stuff that we do good and stuff we do bad. But how many of you know there's some stuff that you do wrong, and you don't like anybody to point that out? There's not a person, listen to me, myself included, who can sit there and say, I'm so holy, I don't need to go back and learn what Jesus taught on the Sermon of the Mount. No, we have not reached it yet. Because it is an upside down kingdom. It's God saying everything you thought was wrong is right. Everything the world says is right is wrong. And maybe you're trying to walk halfway in the world and halfway in the Bible. And you'll never ever understand how to walk in the kingdom until you walk in this five, these three chapters, five, six, and seven are some of the most powerful teaching. And now we're getting ready to walk into the kingdom of God. So he sat him down, and of course he began. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are, for there's the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I just read um, four Beatitudes, and I bet you I've already hit something that you're not doing. Can I tell you something? The Beatitudes are not like the gifts of the spirit. You don't choose and pick which the attitude you want. They're a conglomeration of, they're a, they're a whole. God wants all of us to walk in all of the attitudes. All of the attitudes make us a child of God, not half of them. Not the one you want to walk in. If you're sitting there now and getting ready to judge yourself and say how good you are, and I read this text a thousand times, it's not in the reading of the text. It's when you found out something in the text that you didn't like, did you destroy it? Did you walk in it? Did you ignore it? Or just say, I'm as good, I'm good where I am right now. You know what we like to say, I'm good. No, you're not. I'm good. No. Some of these things we read tonight, we all have to strive 
to try to be what Jesus said to be on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm getting ready to bless somebody tonight. I'm getting ready to bless you because there is something called a simple fix where you make up in your mind, I want my character to line up with the character of God. I want God to get glory out of my life. And I got to tell you, there's a whole lot of days when I don't glorify God. Man, I'm stepping on some toes right now. How many of y'all know when we, when we compare ourselves to this sermon, when we compare ourselves, don't worry, this is Marshall's phone, so I'll be all right. When we compare ourselves to what's known in these, in these uh, chapters, you're going to find out that, that's the what I mean. Okay, let, let me just go through some crazy stuff. Adultery. I know nobody ever committed adultery. Divorce. I know nobody ever worried about that. Swearing. I know you don't swear. Eye for an eye. Now, I know none of y'all out there like to get even with people. <coughs> love your enemies. How many of us know we haven't loved anybody? All I'm trying to tell you is there's some teaching in here that's going to put us in the position, and it's all in order from Christ, that's going to put us in a position to be blessed beyond blessed. Let's get started. Let's talk about it. Matthew, Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the most insightful look into how to act. Tell somebody sitting there with you. I don't care where you stop. Tell them, you know you don't know how to act. Tell them, you don't know how to act. And the reason we don't know how to act is because we act out what the world says, but can we ever act like God? Come on, we know we messed up some stuff already. How to live and, and the changes we need to make in our fleshly body to walk and produce a kingdom life. So, the Sermon on the Mount tells us how to live. Uh, can I ask you to do something for me tonight? Don't do like this man who um, found a powerful microscope. He liked to travel. He was a scientist. He found a powerful microscope, and he was able to look at flowers and see the colors, and he saw wonders under the microscope he had never seen before. So he decided, I love what I'm looking at. I'm going to buy this microscope. He bought the microscope, took it back home. Inadvertently, he was getting ready to eat one of his favorite foods, and he decided to put it under the microscope to look at it. Bad news. Shouldn't have done it. He saw little amoebas, little crawling things, all on his favorite food. He loved this food. He loved it. It was one of his favorite foods. So he said, man, I wish I'd have never known that truth. He said, there's only one thing to do. I'm going to eat this food. So you know what he did? He destroyed the microscope. He said, I don't want a microscope that's going to reveal that kind of truth because it's something I like. That's right. I said it. I'm going somewhere. That's how a lot of us are. We hear a truth and we pick and choose. And that's what you do with the word of God. Everybody's so saved. Everybody's so holy. Are you? Let's compare ourselves to this kingdom. Because what you do is we throw the microscope away when it reveals something that we're doing. Oh, now we'll pick it back up when I can show what my neighbor doing. Man, if I can tell you, you know, he ain't right. She ain't right. Listen, we can all do that. But how many of us know if we ever examine ourselves under the microscope called the word of God, we fall short. Come on, somebody. Thank God for mercy and grace. We fall short. Let's go there. Let's go there. So where do we go in this teaching? It's impossible to live like this without the Spirit of God dwelling in us. So I don't even have to look where I wrote. It's impossible for you to walk this journey without the Spirit of God. And it's impossible if you don't get up every morning and read, associate or read, uh, nitrous, reunite yourself with the Word of God so you can know the Spirit is in control and not my flesh. Please hear me. When your flesh is in control, anything allowed to happen, we know because we've all seen it happen. And so God wants us to have a blessed relationship with him, so he wants to teach us how to have kingdom character. I'm going to stop let you write those two words down. Kingdom character. Stop my blessings. I got no character. Kingdom character. Maybe that's why I get in so many fights with my spouse. Kingdom character. Character. Maybe my kids don't, maybe I can't get along with anybody on the job because my character, wait, you know you can't change anybody's characters with yours, right? Okay, so from one jacked up person to another, can you please hear me tonight? You're going to learn some principles if you listen to what God said. Let's go there. Look at the topics and how they affect our life. I'm going to step over this side just because I can. 
I want to go over the topics. And I'm going to go over the topics of that's con that's contained in these five to seven chapters. We'll write these down. First is the beatitude. Attitude. All of us got one, but the beatitudes tell us the attitude in the kingdom of God. Emulate it, and good things will happen in your life. Don't emulate it, and you're going to be the same kind of Christian you were before you start looking at this teaching. I found myself, I'm so sorry, y'all, but I found myself not progressing, not growing. I found myself mad at myself with some of the things I allow out of my own mouth. Come on, guys, there is no secret. If you want a safe place, the only place you can be and know that you're progressing is to live in the kingdom that Jesus brought down here. He brought the kingdom so that you and I could walk in kingdom principles and be safe. Salt and light, we're going to talk about it. First thing Jesus did after talking about the Beatitudes was said, okay, now that I told you what your attitude should be, now let me see you be the example and live it out as a Christian. Then he talked about Jesus fulfilling the law. We thought he was coming to destroy the law. No, he said, I've come to destroy the law. Once you do these things, you won't need a law. Man, that's so good. If you can walk in these things, all of the law can be thrown away. Anger and murder. Skip that one. You already know that one. You don't need any prime tape. Come on. We all have gotten angry enough. But watch what the heaven, watch what the kingdom says is anger. And we have murdered folk. Lust and adultery. So right now, since I'm talking to good Christians, I know I don't have to worry about lust. But wait till you see what Jesus said about lust. <laughs> you're going to find out. Divorce and remarriage. A topic that has torn up churches. There are people out there now saying, this is right, that's right. They have all kinds of opinions. Let's see what Jesus said about divorce and remarriage. Oaths, about swearing, um, about believing that what you say out of your mouth uh, at that time is above reproach. How many times have you said something, argued something, took a position, was angry about something, thought you knew what you were talking about, grew a little bit and found out I didn't know nothing. My God, I wish I would. But when we get to the point where we start thinking we have it together, we leave the kingdom and our flesh takes over. An eye for an eye. I'm not going to talk about that one because you know that your pastor, well, Shiloh knows that I am an action movie junkie. So, you know, I like somebody. We're going to talk about that. You got to pray for me. I like folk when they get somebody back, but that's not kingdom like so. Do not judge, ask, seek, and not. You gotta write these down because we're gonna go through these. And then the narrow gate, the false prophets. Now you know we can't hit on this tonight, but we're gonna start with the Beatitudes. Eight statements. Nine, some people say. That if I could just get you to put those eight statements down in your heart and decide to live those eight statements, you don't. You can go to heaven. You you can leave here now. Matter of fact, anybody who adjusts to that level, Enoch, take it out of here. Anybody who gets to the point that you can live all this right, then you don't need this teaching, but you also need to be sitting next to Jesus on the right hand of the throne of the Lord. Please hear me. That's why Jesus said he jumped right in. Let me tell you, if you want to change your life, you want to be able to say, I make progress. Listen to this. Each beatitude declares behavior or attitudes that the world calls weak or disadvantageous will actually lead to the blessings. Here's what, here's what the kingdom principle. It's in such, what God tells us to do is such opposed to our natural actions that it has to be spirit-led. That's the problem. Because what Jesus tells us to do, when I look through my earthly eyes, it looks like that's crazy. That's a disadvantage. I'm not letting nobody talk to me like that. They're not walking all over me. God said, you're so far from the kingdom because any heathen 
can act like you do, almighty Christian man and woman. Please listen. I know somebody don't like that already. You threw your microscope away already, didn't you? Don't do that. If you get hurt tonight, only know that I'm getting ready to change my character. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Jesus first went into the first fundamental teaching of being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit means that I realize how needy I am. Um, it, it's, I know that I need to belong to Christ. Now, watch the blessing. The word blessed here is the word happiness, uh, makarios in the Greek. Happiness or blessing is an internal joy. It's above happiness on the earth. Makarios. It means that um, I find as long as I can hold on to God, I can still be happy. Hmm, somebody just shouted right there. If I can hold on to God, I can be happy. Now, you know, don't look at me like that. You were in a stressed out period, you were going through a stressed out moment, and don't tell me life won't stress you out, and at that moment, you got happy because you start thinking, man, I got a word inside of me. That's what carries. So you start thinking, my situation is bad, but the joy of the Lord is still there. That's what carries. It's like, it's never ever really hopeless. I always got, even though my bank account doesn't say anything, I got a stash that nobody knows about. That's what carries. That's what these attitudes are about. Blessed or happy is the man. The first way to be happy, he said, is to be poor in spirit. This is something we all can identify with because we need to realize that when we got saved, it was because we recognized that we were poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means that I want my, I know that I need God, and because I know that I need God, I'm really rich. I don't have material wealth, but I got a whole lot of godly wealth. I got the Holy Ghost, the anointing, I got the word of God that never fails. I got all those things on my side, so my spirit is so lacking without those things. So to be poor in spirit is to recognize that I need God on my side. It means that when I'm happy or when I'm poor in spirit, I realize who God is. Uh, let me give you a, a biblical example. Right now in Luke 18. Um, uh, right now Matthew 11, 29 and 30. These all tell us about being poor in spirit. My spiritual needs. Come on, guys. When your spiritual need, when you realize that me on my own, I can't do what I need to do. But the closer I get to God, the better I'm going to be. Remember the publican and the sinner? The publican was not poor in spirit. He didn't think he needed anything. He walked into the temple and said, thank God I'm not like other folk. I know, I know, I know no publican listening to me tonight already. Right? <laughs> You're not sitting there saying, well, I'm not like that. I know I need the Lord. But as soon as you say it in that attitude, you missed what I'm talking about. Look what he said. He said, thank God I'm not like those other folk. And it says, all the sinner did was looked up and said, sinner and pumpkin, all he did was looked up and said, hey, um, God have mercy on me. God, there are days when I want God just to look past what I've done. You ever had a day? Maybe two days? Yesterday. Where you did something you know wasn't God, and you're just glad God had mercy on you. That's when, you're, when you know that you're poor in spiritual wealth, and I got to get more. I need more. I need more. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 29 and 30, take my yoke upon you. That's what it is. He said, get out of your feelings. <laughs> get out of your feelings. I don't feel right. He said, forget that. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. He said, I'm lowly in spirit. He said, I'm there already. I'm humble. I'm lowly. He said, and then you'll find some rest for your soul, Matthew 11, 29, 30. What am I telling you? Poor in spirit means I got to wake up knowing that I still have a need for God. And it's something because certainly those who are poor in spirit are aware of their spiritual lack. That is, they are aware of their utter need for God, thus they open themselves up to receive God. Can I stop here and tell you to do something? Can you, under your breath, I'm, like, I'm, I'm going to slow down a little bit so you can do it, because I had to do this as I was writing. Repent right now. That 
you desire some stuff, but you never let God speak to your heart. Repent right now that you went off, and God said, if you would just turn to me, I could have fixed that. So Jesus said, if you want to walk in the spirit, in the kingdom, the first step is realize spiritually you're poor, that you need me in your life every day. Second beatitude, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This one really goes against the world. This is the one where the world says we are weak. I ain't that kind of guy. I don't be crying about nothing. Uh, I don't want nobody to think that I'm mourning or that I'm crying. My wife will tell you, I go to movies sometimes and I'm trying to hide, hide my eyes because what happens is to, to mourn, this is the deepest word in the Greek. If you have a uh, if you go look this word up, it's the word pentheo, pentheo. Pentheo is the deepest word mourn. It means as you're mourning over someone dead. Watch what Jesus said. Blessed are those, happy are those who can mourn about the injustices in the world, who can cry with other people, who can relax their guard and don't care what anybody else says. They're grieving over the sin that they allow in their life, and we're grieving over the sin that's in the world, period. I don't want to see anybody hungry. Can you cry when you think about a child not eating? Well, you, do you know when you're sitting there with all of your lavish stuff, is there something in your heart that makes you think about I mourn. When someone in your congregation has lost a spouse, you know, you're walking out, maybe you're mad at your right now. Oh, that's good. But have you ever thought about how lonely they are? While you're locked in, have you ever thought about, what about a single person who's all by themselves with none? If you're one of those people that, but they got Jesus, that's my point. Your heart has been hardened. All you do is think about what you have, and all you want is more and more and more of what you have, instead of saying, God said, in the kingdom, I mourn. And you better be glad God said, blessed are they who mourn. You know why? Because Jesus cried. You remember the scripture when it says, Jesus wept. Many times he looked out over his children and he cried because his heart was so, he mourned about the injustices in other people. I don't get folk who don't care anything about social justice. You don't care anything about what's going on in the world. You don't care. It's like, as long as I can live in my little holy cocoon, you know, where we can sit on top of it and judge, look down on folk and judge them. And all, that is so crazy. He said, you, you can't walk in the kingdom like that. Walking in the kingdom requires the spirit to soften our heart so you know what God is trying to do in your heart. Um, mourning is when I don't mind giving up something I have for someone else. Because the mourning says, it seems rather counterintuitive that more folk can be called happy. But the Beatitudes are talking about the kind of mourning that God fills our heart. Because one of the best feelings in the world, look at me, and don't front, don't front. Come on, man. None of us are that tough for real. I, I know, I, I always talk about when I'm doing relationship counseling and you got the women and men and, and the brothers have been real tough in a relationship. And a woman has been hanging in there trying to get her relationship together and the brothers still act like, you know, I'm all right, you know. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Cook my food. Wash my clothes. Be there for me. You know, kind of stuff that make, make a woman say, I need a wife. And then all of a sudden, she done had enough. I'm going to give you a secret. When a woman has had enough, they had enough. So she said no. So they came for counseling. And I'm going to tell you, I can count the times, nine out of ten, it is the man who starts saying, oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, baby, oh, baby, come back, baby, oh, baby. Because all of a sudden, their life was all about them. And they lost their good thing. And all of a sudden, they turned into a mourner. But I wish you could transfer the mourning of what I lost into the mourning of what's going on in the world. Mourn for other things. If we love God, we will love all those who belong to God. Every human being without exception comes from God and is loved by God with an incomprehensible love. And so the more we enter into the heart of God, the more we discover what our neighbor needs. You want to find yourself close to God? Start thinking about someone right now today. You, you want to say you're in the kingdom? You left the world. As soon as you become a mourner, you left the world. You are now in the kingdom of God. 
Third one, I'm going quickly so we can get there. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is when you turn the other cheek. It's a gentle spirit. Here's what it is. It's to be wronged, but strong enough to hold back your rage. It's to be in the house with your children and not scream over every toy that's on the floor. It's for your spouse to burn the cornbread and you don't make them feel like somebody's dog. I know y'all don't like this tonight. Stay with me. It's when in your heart, meek folk is anger under control. It's when I can see it is not good in any situation for me to lose it right now. Because when I lose it, I lose part of me and I definitely walk away from God. Look what it says. The meek is a spirit, is a gentle spirit. The poor in spirit mourn the miseries of others because they really know the misery and are moved to share it and are gentle toward those who are suffering. So meek spirit means that we're not quick to take offense at other folk. I'm trying to help you live in your house right now. If you've been bickering or you've been going back and forth and somebody made you mad, you acquire a meek spirit, you will be the winner. A meek spirit is Jesus at the cross, and they were spitting at him. And they nailed him to the cross and planted thorns, a crown of thorns on his head. Can you believe the first word from the cross was, Father, forgive them? Do you know how spiritual it is for someone to wrong you? But you can say, Father, forgive them. Come on, we all messed up. We done, we done messed up on this point. Somebody just tell me, yeah, Pastor, I messed up. Come on, say it. You messed up, and I messed up. And because, watch Moses. The Bible says Moses was the meekest man in the world. If you ever have the argument of whether or not there is predestination and free will, I can help you one day because really it's a combination of both. Because the reality is you've been predestined, but there's still choices you can make. So watch this. So Moses was labeled in the scripture, the scripture of lie, as the meekest man that ever was. But it was he got a chance to look at the promised land, but he couldn't go into the promised land because that one time he missed it. I told you the Beatitudes are crazy. That one time he missed it. Think about none of us. None, nary, nobody would have seen it. If God was still judging us by the one mistake, somebody say, whoo, none of us would make it. The reality is, Moses was me, but he still had a chance to make a choice. So I'm telling you that part of walking in the kingdom is to make choices to walk in the kingdom. The ability is in you because the kingdom of God is in you, but you have to make the choice. And the worldly choice feels a lot better than the kingdom choice. Understand that. So let's talk about me. What do I mean by me? Uh, I'm going to go back to the meekness for a minute. I was watching that movie Witness, Harrison Ford. Uh, remember when the little boy saw a murder? He was Amish. And so they shot Harrison Ford as he was trying to get him into witness protection. And he went and stayed in the Amish country. Well, Harrison Ford was, went into town with them one day. And in town, they used to always pick at the Amish because the Amish were gentle people that didn't fight. So they threw ice cream in their face and knocked their hat off and did all this stuff. And the other Amish people were saying, you know, don't do anything, don't do anything. Harrison Ford punched the man out. I gotta tell you, pray for me now. I was home. This is a game. Why did you let that man throw the ice cream in your face? Why are you let somebody smack you around? It hit me that I was rooting for revenge because that's in our nature. When one of the men said, I ain't never seen an armor jack like that before, you must have never been to my neighborhood. Because that's how we act when somebody does something. All I'm saying to you is, I'm talking about extremes now, but there are some things you can be very forgiving. Can I help you out tonight, practical teaching? Next time somebody mess up, give them a compliment. Say, oh, that wasn't that bad. It's not in you, is it? Next time somebody do something you don't like, instead of rolling your eyes and sucking your teeth, I said it, that's what you do. You let so Sometimes our body language tell folk, I don't even like you. Instead of acting like that, practice walking in the kingdom and say, I'm going to be meek. Why? why? What, what happens to me? Uh, 
Let me go back and see what it says. They inherit the earth. The only folk who will really be in charge are those who are meek enough to be in charge. The next one is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, you got to want to, uh, let me get the rest of this up. The scripture must be read in historical context because um, the average people in Palestine in biblical times knew what it meant to be hungry. They knew what it meant to be thirsty. A lot of us have never been that hungry or thirsty the way the scripture is talking about. But to be really hungry and thirsty, it says that's how you have to thirst after righteousness. It's like one in your steak at Texas Roadhouse and you thought the, the, the waiter forgot you and put somebody ahead of y'all and I'm hungry. You got to throw the place up. Good thing they got no more peanuts out there. You throw the peanuts at everybody. Because what happens is we have gotten to the point that when we thirst and hunger in our flesh, we will go out of our way. Come on, I'm not the only one. When we were out there in the world doing what we did, Come on, this code talk. For doing what we did, I'm going to let it get in your mind. Doing what you used to do, I'm talking about, you know, creeping, sneaking. What does that song say? Freaks come out at night. Hey, hey, hey. Freak. You know what I'm talking about? When it got dark and we were sneaking around doing our thing, it's because I thirst. Man, I'm thirsting for this sin. I'm thirsting for what I need. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to do it. Come on, I'm not going to be one. You know what I'm talking about, that when we thirst and hunger. Uh, there was a story about a, a young man went to his rabbi, went to the priest and said, uh, how, how can I find God and have a good relationship with God? The preacher said, follow me down to the lake. So the boy followed down to the lake and they got into the water. He said, now, immerse yourself under the water. And when the boy got under the water, the man put his hand on the boy's head, held him down there. A long time. The boy started bubbling and bobbling. Hands is coming up. You can see, and the man would not let him up. Put two hands down. Pretty soon, when the boy stopped struggling, he threw him up. And the boy went knocking the water down. He said, what is wrong with you? He said, well, you asked me what it means to thirst after God. If you want God, when you want God, as much as you wanted that breath of air, when I let you out the water, that's how you know you're thirsty. Many of us don't realize we don't really thirst and hunger after God. When we hungry and thirsty for God is when we've already eaten everything else and it don't work. God said, thirst and hunger after me. You know what happened? You'll get up in the morning and you'll be walking in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is referring to hunger pains that they knew about. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Um I want you to see this. Can you see this? The Latin word for mercy is misericordia. 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 There he is. The word means the heart, core of God, Dias, touching our misery. Misery. Our minds. Watch this. Here's what God said. When the only reason I'm merciful to you is because God has been merciful for me, to me. We forget that we love to get mercy, but we don't want to give nobody mercy. Let me give an example. Come on, stay with me. If you break a dish in the kitchen, all you want somebody to do is have to clean it up. Somebody else break a dish, say, you broke, what the hell you broke the dish? You have a car accident. It's like, it was an accident. It was out of control. Somebody else have a car accident. Y'all can't see my wife's face now. <laughs> you lose it <laughs> with someone else. I've been there. I told you. I've been there. All, all mercy says is, please treat me like you want to be treated. Oh, man, if we could walk in these principles, think how much better our life would be because we actually grab hope. Some of you have left the house and left folk mad. Call yourself a Christian. And didn't care. And came home and still had an attitude. And got one now. You can listen to Bible study. When you get done, still got an attitude. It's because we had to learn. We'll never get the blessing or the real happiness until we get the kingdom of God. Let me say what happiness for a minute. Whatever you think will make you happy is fleeting. Sex, fleeting. Party, fleeting. 
get in your way. So it gets boring after a while. That's why rich folks start doing dumb stuff. That's why Mike Jackson was talking about had to go around and get a zoo. He tried everything else, he still wasn't happy. So he had to get some animal. Mike had a monkey. <laughs> like you don't hear me. How come rich folk get divorced over and over again? Because happiness is not found outside of the kingdom. And we haven't gotten it yet. We like the stuff we like, but when a truth is exposed that I don't like, I destroy it. Matter of fact, I'll talk about the preacher if he talk about my truth. Because I want to hold on to my stuff. Oh, somebody, somebody don't like me. Nice. Stay with me. God enters into our misery by becoming a man in the person of Christ. He does so to eject the comfort of his presence. Can I ask you to do me a favor this week? If you don't get nothing else out of this, teacher, out of this teaching, be that presence of comfort. In, you will, somebody will think that you done went out and had some drugs. Go home and be nice. What? Go home and be nice. Some of you have not even been nice. Matter of fact, people don't think you know how to be nice. You, and so if you practice mercy or these the attitudes we've gone through so far, it will change the course of your life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What he's saying is pure is unmixed. Let's break it down to practical language. What I see in the light is what you are in the dark. That's all pure in heart means. It means I'm not two-faced. It means I'm not one thing when people are looking and something else when people are not looking. Uh, pure in heart is when I make sure my character is such that I represent God. Um, you know the old saying that, are there some times when you're glad God is not in your house? Or are there some rooms you can't let God in? Or are there some times you said, I'm sure glad that I didn't, you know, God, that you didn't see that when he really did see it. But all we're talking about is you look nice on the outside, but on the inside, your heart is not pure. The only people who are pure in heart, look what you get when you're pure in heart. You shall see God. You know why? Because when you're pure in heart, people are going to walk over you. They're going to step on you. They're going to get worldly fame and worldly advantages, but you will see God. That's why Jesus didn't mind what they said to him or what they did to him. You'll see, God. I, re I remember we were watching the, the reunion of um, Family Matters. And one of the greatest characters, movie characters, television characters in this 21st century was Steve Urkel, played by Jamil Wright. I'm watching this because everybody knows Steve Urkel was a loving character. We all love him. Even when he plays stepmom, we all love him. But watch this. Did you know Steve Urkel? Excuse me. Jaleel Wright has been in court for beating his wife, had to get a restraining order. Did you know that people who look nice on TV might not be who they are? The other character that played Eddie on television, he beat his wife. What I'm saying is your heart dictates what you really are. That's why we say follow somebody home. We we know what the person is like when they're not in church around the preacher. We can act good around the preacher. We, look, we act good in church. But what happens when we see somebody, when we see what they really like? Who is that? A heart unmixed with any other competing love. I love God so much that I want him to always be proud of me. I don't always make it. I don't always make it. I don't always make it. But if you're trying to walk in the kingdom, if you're trying to change your character, Always act like God is watching you. Don't you don't you do what I told you earlier? That's why I brought it up. So you're gonna hear this teaching. Oh yeah, I know Reverend Duncan. No, come on. They got nothing to do with your heart and your how you act. Don't destroy truth because it just taps you. The truth is we all are just striving. This stuff is crazy. We can't live to this in one lifetime. We need the spirit to help us get to where Jesus was at. But Jesus said, This is what happens in the kingdom. Some people love creation more than the creator. We love the stuff more than we love God. We love the wealth more than we love God. No, we'll do. We'll thank God for the wealth, but then we'll ignore his principles in our life. Sometimes the more we get, the worse off we are. We, it's like the more things we have, the worse we treat people because we act like we don't need stuff. What am I talking about? Blessed are the peacemakers. 
they shall be called the children of God. The Latin word for peace is pax, which means unity. Love unites, hate divides. One of the hardest things to be is a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone who does not have peace, they create peace. I'm gonna stay here for a minute. When you walk into the room, do people run? When you walk in the room, do people know things just got better? Or do things just get worse? Peacemakers are the one people know when they come, they're gonna love me no matter what. Peacemakers get into a bad situation and turn that bad situation into a good situation. Watch this. They bring harmony to people. Are you the kind of person who say, I'm so glad you got here? Because I know things are getting ready to get better when you showed up. A peacemaker is not a peace nick. Rather, he is one who's willing to make peace. Meaning, I don't walk around trying to put peace where there should be um, correction. But I put peace to make sure the situation doesn't get out of hand. I don't want my house to be torn up. I don't want people to get to the point where they don't know God is a God who brings peace into our life. Blessed are those, it's a good one here, guys, who are persecuted for, the, persecuted for the sake of what is right, but theirs is the kingdom of God. There's no pleasure in being persecuted. But if the persecution is not acted upon because you're trying to be poor in spirit, merciful, a mourner, hunger and thirsting after righteousness, you're trying to be a peacemaker, you're now persecuted for the kingdom of God. And good things happen in the kingdom of God. Romans 5, 3 through 5. It tells us, therefore we rejoice in tribulation because tribulation, and it goes to this series of things that tribulation will do. And at the end of our tribulation will be joy. We get the joy. It's, it's when we allow the persecution to come into our life that we become better. It's when we, we don't invite persecution, but if I'm suffering for God, on the end there's going to be something. So you all up in my, uh, all up in my grill, and, and we're in a restaurant, and you're acting unseen, but I decide I'm going to take the Christian road. That's when God says, I'm persecuted or suffering for the kingdom. When I'm suffering for the kingdom, things happen in my life that make me see God before I see you. Ooh, that's so good. I'm looking for God and not glory from the world. Somebody say that with me. I'm looking for God and not glory from the world. Then, when you leave this teaching tonight and you walk up in your bedroom, you know, I told you earlier, the freaks come out at night, but so do the demons. So do the spiritual warfare. With the lights on, there can be a good time, and you can be acting like you got together in front of other people, but when you lay down, don't try to fool me, that's when the demonic warfare starts. And the only thing you got to fight with is your righteousness. Did I make a good stand for God? I can then, I'm telling you, you want to have some sweet sleep? No. You know what, God, me and God, we talking, you know we talking? Because God, here was tonight, I could have acted up, but I, I maintained my cool because of who you are. And it's the secret joy that's there. It's like, I'm being persecuted, but it's like, I know a reward is coming. This is what the book text says. You become aware that you receive the gift of being drawn into the very heart of silence. Watch this. I get drawn to a place that my surroundings no longer affect me, noise everywhere, and they wonder why I can answer sweetly. Proverbs tells us that a soft answer turneth away wrath. Because when I get to the point that I can stand persecution, the devil has nothing to fight me with. Because now I can handle anything that's coming my way. I go into a world of silent earth and joyful heavenly bliss. I'm not going to just do this one. I'm going to be done tonight. Because it's time to close. Watch this. Jesus taught those Beatitudes. He taught, if I can handle knowing I need him, number one, if I can be a person who mourns about the disadvantages of others, if I can be merciful, 
I can thirst and hunger. If I can walk in this kingdom teaching, this discourse that Jesus had, I then have spiritual power, miracles will happen, I can lay hands on sick folk, I'll be, a, I'll be a different people because I'm in a different plane. I'm in a different place. Nothing rattles me. Not because nothing rattles me, but because I decided to walk in a kingdom that's not on this earth. He said to act that out. Can we just do these two and then we close? He said act that out. How? Be the attitudes. Jesus used parables to explain the true characteristics of those who are worthy of being God's children. Taking an example of the common cooking ingredient salt, Jesus explains how we can make a difference in the world. We know the scripture. Uh, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Can I read that? Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Read it with me. So I said, I didn't know. All I'm telling you is now Jesus is asking us to do some stuff that's almost impossible and is impossible without the Spirit of God to guide us. Look what it says. You who, those who confess to be saints of God, you're the salt of the earth. When salt has lost its Savior, Nothing can be seen, but it's cast out and found unquote. You are the light of the world. These two scriptures both speak the same principle. God said, the only way the world can tell there is a different kingdom, if you demonstrate it. You can't be a cusser. Got your attention there, didn't it? Somebody say cursing. No, curse is different. Cousin. You can't be a practicing cusser in front of unbelievers or other saints who are trying to do well. I know I hit a nerve tonight, but listen to me. You can't, let me give you a great example. I remember I was talking to some young people about why they should not commit adultery. Excuse me, fornicate. And why they shouldn't go to the clubs in the skinny little clothes. Y'all stay with me. And we were talking, and they were telling me about dancing. I said, well, you gotta be very, you know, uh, make sure that you're a good example why you're doing this. Nothing wrong with hanging out with your friends. Let me be honest with you. Me and my wife drive down the road. Can't do it now because of the virus. But when we take our trips down to Washington, D.C., I got all old school. I like old school. I'm telling you, me and Delphine, we kicking it. La, 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 la. Me and I love you. I'm just saying. See, y'all trying to hide stuff. Nothing wrong. Me and her in the car, we have the liberty to live to some old school. I can still turn on Hezekiah. I can turn on Anthony Brown. But every now and then, I need some temptation. What? My girl. Yes, sir. Come on. Quick, quick. No, you got to give me no amens on my girl. <laughs> but <laughs> ain't no woman like the one I got. Come on. So anyway, all I'm saying is, but you have to be an example. I would not ride down the road with my oldies with everybody. Because some folk judge. And I can't do stuff that would make other saints become weak. What I'm telling you is, I try to be honest with God, but I also try to be responsible. I am the light of the world. I can't do things that's going to make my brother or my sister weak. If you have liberty, the scripture said, have it to yourself. So anyway, I told the kids, they said, well, we go to the bar and we dance. And I said, you know what? Okay, cool. Me and Sister Duncans, we going to come out and kick it with y'all tonight. You got the best friend there? All right, you bring them to church Sunday, right? All right, we're going to the club with you. What are we going to jam? We're going to jam. We're going to do what we're going to do. What are we drinking? You know, Pastor, you can't do that. I said, well, excuse me. Why can you do it and I can't do it? Do you know those kids just spoke the revelation that most of us live by? Ask some of the young folk. We're glad. We surely tell them to do stuff that we don't demonstrate. We tell them stuff that we do not model. We tell them things about Christ that we don't emulate, and they can see it. What am I talking about? We're the light of the world. All that means is let your witness show. So I just gave you a real example. There's some things I would not do. And there's some things in the world that you can't do and still be saying, I know I got liberty. Y'all old folks got nothing to do with old. Come on, you got the spirit of God in you. Some things you shouldn't let the world do because then the world won't believe Christ is real. Something in your walk ought to hold you back from acting like the rest of the world. So, saw and light. Look what Jesus said. He took a, a parable, which he loved to do. Saw, and then he talked about the light. 
And the rest of the world, here's my closing, the rest of the world is going to be a dark place if none of us ever become the light. Where's the kingdom of God? In you. Can anybody see it? If you demonstrate it. Is my house different? Do they know? To next week, we're going to talk about divorce and about cutting off your hands. And we're going to talk about going to hell. So I thought this was talk to his disciples. Yeah. Remember, just because you say you say, if there is no demonstrable activity, if there is no fruit, we're all in danger. All right. It'll get better. We're going to give God praise wherever you are. Tonight, we're talking about what? Striving. I'm striving. You always got something to strive for. I'm striving. You want to spend this time locked down? Strive. Practice these beatitudes and watch how hard it is. Practice them tonight, tomorrow, and watch how it gets. Tonight, two things I want to say to you. First of all, um, I want to thank all of you online people who have been so faithful. All of our online church folk, our community of online worshipers, thank you. You have, uh, have made the devil a liar by reaching out for the underdog word of God. Thank you, Shiloh members who have been faithful. We're all one church faithful for making sure that you are a good steward of the secrets that God has given you. There's plenty of work we can do. And if you need salvation, please repeat this word after me. Let's, let's, let's do a salvation prayer very quickly. Say these words. I don't know who you are sitting in your house tonight, but I never want to close without giving you a chance to seek God. Tomorrow is not promised. Let's pray. Father God, say these words after me. Say with me. Father God, I know I'm a sinner. I've been running from your goodness. Lord, I believe tonight that you did die on the cross. You rose with all power in your hand. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are Lord and Savior of the world. Because I confess it. Say these words about me. I am saved. Say this. Jesus is Lord. If you pray that prayer with us tonight, I want you to go and start reading the Gospel of John, the affirmative Gospel, and see the blessing that God talks about. That's that third chapter about being born again. God can come into your heart. And I gotta leave you with this. Because of technology, all of you have been given to our ministry, um, and those have been given by Cash App. Give them a file, you're doing great. PayPal, you're doing great. Those of you are doing good. Some of you gave to our ministry. We set up. There was too many shadow actresses coming into Cash App, so we had to put our new uh, handle, Shiloh2, T-W-O. Go to your Cash App, look at it, Shiloh2. Now, all of you who gave, you got your money back. That's what I want to tell you. The good thing is, because there was a mix-up, your money was sent back to you. You sent it to us, we sent it back to you. You sent it to us, we sent it back to you. Now that we got it fixed, send it back to us. <laughs> now, now that it's fixed, all I'm saying is we thank you for your contributions, but I want you to have faith. We straightened out our cash app. Uh, hey, a lot of Shiloh Baptist churches, but now, write this down. Shiloh TWO. Last thing is, don't forget, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Shiloh Baptist Church, Port Norris. Go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, so that we can do some things with our YouTube channel. We're almost there. We need some more subscribers. Share this teaching tonight. Go view our page, our Facebook page, and like it. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a great night. We love you. And remember, keep striving to walk in the kingdom of God.